What's going on guys? We're back and I hope you're all enjoying your holiday season. It's cold as anything where I am right now. My joints are stiff and I'm wearing pajamas under my jeans to stay warm. I think I need to take a brief vacation to the Maza region. Yes, that blazing fictional sun and the host of wonderful tropical Pokemon is exactly what I need to regain feeling in my freezing fingers. Or maybe I just need to turn up the heat in my apartment. The last time we visited our hypothetical Gen 9 Pokemon region, I introduced you all to a new set of Mons, the Chroman line, and we updated the art and designs of the Techupi line. Today, we're going to see a little more of the same, a rework of three pre-existing Maza region Pokemon, and the introduction of an entirely new line. We're also going to discuss a little bit about the concept of design conventions, and how they can limit or improve your art. All six of the Pokemon that we'll see in this video were influenced by this principle of illustration, and whether you're aware of it or not, a lot of you use it in your critiques of my work and the works of others. If you watch our channel a lot, you've already heard me use this phrase before. Design convention. Yeah, I know I say it a lot, but I've never stopped to consider if you all know what it means. Is it a gathering of artists in a big public space? Design con? <laughs> no, no, not exactly. When I use the phrase design convention, I'm referring to a set of unspoken rules that unifies a collection of character designs. For example, a consistent design convention in the world of Dark Souls is the use of European medieval visual motifs. If you wanted to design a character that looked as if it belonged in the world of Dark Souls, you'd be well advised to die in some knight armor, dragons, or other similar visuals. Design conventions can be applied in more specific ways, too. Let's look at Pokemon. I know you guys like to do that. Because a core mechanic of Pokemon games revolves around elemental typing, consistent design conventions are used to distinguish these types so as to facilitate young players' ability to recognize each type just by looking at the Pokemon. For example, fire types tend to use reds, yellows, and oranges in their color palettes. Dark types are often unfriendly, mischievous, or straight up scary in their appearance. And bug types, well, bug types usually look like bugs. Similar conventions also exist for concepts in Pokemon such as legendaries, mythicals, or starters. Legendaries give the impressions of gods on earth, powerful, supernatural, and usually confrontational. Mythicals are usually even stranger, not necessarily scary or tough, but still conveying a sense of unearthly power. And starters, as we've discussed before, need to look friendly, tough, and reflect the strength and growth of their trainers, usually with anthropomorphic features. But here's the best part about design conventions. They exist to be followed as much as they do to be broken. Look at a Pokemon like Delmize. The first time I saw this Pokemon in Sun and Moon, I had no idea what type it was. I caught it while fishing, and it looked like an anchor. I assumed water type. Never would I have guessed that this was a grass and ghost type. But isn't it kind of awesome that its design had that effect on me? Sure, you could make the argument that breaking convention is confusing to an audience, but if your goal is to confuse, well, the mission accomplished. The key to a strong character design is to have a theme in mind before you even put pen to paper, and once that theme is clear in your mind, you can use tools like design conventions to help convert your ideas into strong visuals. If you want to create a fire-type Pokemon based around a theme like Fury, then you might want to stick with the established conventions of that type. Those sorts of visuals lend themselves to such a theme. But if the idea is more abstract, and you want your design to make a viewer stop and ponder for a second, design conventions are there for you to bend or break to your advantage. For those of you who haven't skipped this part just to get to the Pokemon are probably thinking, what does this have to do with the Pokemon that you're designing in this video? Hasn't every Pokemon you've designed so far either conformed or broken these so-called design conventions that you're talking about? Well, yes, you're right. This kind of thing can be applied to any of my previous Pokemon designs. The reason why it's so important here has to do with the three Pokemon I'd like to redesign. The Zolsmol line, my designated pseudo-legendaries for the Maza region, and maybe some of the most polarizing Fagemon that I've designed so far. Some of you love them, others just like the first form, and some of you really, really hated them all. But strong opinions aside, a valid critique I heard from all of you was that they didn't feel enough like pseudo-legendaries. And after analyzing the design conventions that exist in pseudo legendary so far, I ended up agreeing. So we're going to start off this video today by making some slight adjustments to that line, and hopefully you guys will feel more like they are deserving of the title pseudo legendary. Then I'm going to show you guys a new three staged evolutionary line, and let you decide if they look as though they either match the current design conventions of other existing pseudo legendaries, subvert these conventions enough to warrant an honorary pseudo legendary status or just don't quite look like they work as pseudo-legendaries at all. 
We'll start at the beginning with the fan favorite Zolsmol. At first, I thought I wasn't going to change anything about Zolsmol at all. Its big head, its dumb little eyes, and its big blue tongue. Really, my only big problem with its original design was it looked a bit too balanced. Its head, its body, and its forelegs were all about the same size and shape and took up about the same amount of space. I also felt like its gills, which I designed to mimic the shape of dog ears and a simplified flame, were a bit unexciting and bland. Those were my biggest changes, making the gills fold around the head and bend at the tips so that they looked more like a flickering flame, and the ears of an excited puppy. I also changed the shape of the back legs. They looked too developed in the first design. I wanted them to look almost vestigial, while the front legs stayed thick and powerful to imply an untempered strength and unruly energy. I added more yellow into the palette too, to help conform a bit more to the existing conventions of other Fire-type Pokémon. In my original video when I introduced this line, I spoke a bit about how design conventions like this can be bent to create something novel and unique. I don't want to backpedal on that sentiment, but I do think that there are subtle changes I can make to help people who disagree feel a little bit more comfortable with this design. Subsequently, I had to change the eyes to blue so that they didn't get lost in the yellow of its gills. Zolsmol, the water pup Pokémon. Zolsmol live in remote and isolated bodies of water deep in the Maza jungle. They prefer the dark, as their sensitive skin can be damaged easily by the sun. Despite their reclusive nature, trainers who seek these Pokémon find them incredibly friendly and energetic. So long as their skin stays moist, they can live comfortably out of water, and in spite of their underdeveloped legs, enjoy running around with their trainers on land. In battle, they use their elongated tongue to lash out at foes. The tongue is as vulnerable as it is dangerous, and young Zolsmol often hurt themselves in the process. The second stage of the Zolsmo line, Amphibark, needed a lot of work. More so than the unusual final form, the second stage of this evolutionary line was panned by a majority of commenters in its video. I think that the biggest problem people were having with this design was the shape of its head. Understandable, it looks very strange, but not really in a good way. I wanted this whole line to look a little weird, but the perspective of this pose made the shape of its head just seem unconsidered, not really intentionally strange. That was the first change that I made. To give it more of a yappy little dog feeling, I gave it a big lower jaw with a bit of an underbite. I also changed the pose a bit more. It was so stiff before, and the dog feeling I wanted from the design was lost a bit because of this lack of personality. Like with Zolsmol, I wanted the gills to be a little bit more interesting. That took some figuring out, but what I ended up with looks a lot better. The final change was the addition of four large claws on each of its front legs. This makes it seem a bit tougher, and the additional splash of yellow in its palette looks much nicer. Amphibark, the water dog Pokémon. Amphibark's limbs are designed for both aquatic and terrestrial locomotion, but it seems to prefer living on land more. On land, their delicate gills must stay wet in order for them to breathe properly, but in the rainy jungles that they call home, they can accomplish this without ever having to return to water. They also regulate their body temperature through these gills, and will sometimes radiate excess heat up to 300 degrees Fahrenheit. This heat can be redirected as attacks in battle. Now, on to Perizotal. When people said that these mons didn't feel enough like pseudo-legendaries, I assume they were referring primarily to the final form, the actual pseudo-legendary. They pointed to it not looking big enough, tough enough, and in general, felt it just looked too goofy. The former, I understand. It did look a little squishy for a Pokémon with stats comparable to a Legendary, though I still argue that Pokémon like Dragonite or Gudra also fall under this bending of design convention. My idea to address these critiques was to change the silhouette. More sharp edges, and complexity in the shapes. Even though Dragonite and Gudra are both big and round, they do have a lot of small details that add to the uniqueness of each of their designs and silhouettes. Most of that change happened in the gills like with the previous two forms, but I also added a set of claws on the front legs like I did with Amphibark. Now, to address the critique about it looking too goofy, unfortunately, I don't want to change that. <laughs> the face references Mesoamerican carvings and paintings of deific characters, and while it does look strange, that is entirely intentional. The vacant stare, the tongue hanging out, and the implied overbite are all things that I love about this Pokémon, and as much as I want to please everybody watching these videos, I can't compromise my own taste on this one. Hopefully, you guys feel like your other critiques were addressed successfully in this redesign. Perizotal, the Cenote Pokémon. These incredibly rare Pokémon live in massive underground lakes. 
These lakes are connected through caves and tunnels, and Perizotl can navigate the jungle through these secret passageways. They share their territory with Zolupine, and when the two Pokémon meet, the ensuing battles can be catastrophic. Perizotl can heat up the water around it from its specialized external gills. This superheated water will occasionally erupt from beneath the ground, showering the surrounding area with scalding hot rain. Alright kiddos, what do we think about these changes to the Zolsmol line? I do think that the majority of your critiques were valid, and I agree that these changes were necessary to help the line feel more like the rare and powerful pseudo-legendaries that people expect to see in a Pokemon game. For these guys, I accepted that some conventions are better left adhered to, for the sake of consistency. Especially in the world of Pokemon, where concepts like pseudo-legendaries are so well established, and fans have a standard of expectation when they encounter a new one. Now, let's go into the new Pokemon designs I made for this video. With this evolutionary line, we're going to be doing things a little bit differently. Initially, I thought these three were going to be designed as pseudo-legendaries too, but the themes and visuals that I was using to inform the designs took priority over the existing conventions for pseudo-legendaries, and now, I don't know. So it'll be up to you guys. Do you think that the Pokemon I'm about to show you work as a set of pseudo-legendaries, or should they just keep the stats that I gave them? You decide. So, as you might have guessed already, the line draws most of its visual inspiration from hummingbirds. Hummingbirds in the ancient Aztec culture held specific significance. Not only did one of their deities sometimes take the form of a hummingbird, but there was also a belief that fallen warriors would sometimes be resurrected as the birds, or a sort of man-bird spirit fighter entity. A lot of people have suggested that I use this aspect of Aztec mythology to inform a Pokémon's design, and I'm finally doing it. This first form is small and cute, but because I wanted them to be fighting types, it also looks a bit scrappy. The shape of the feathers on its head mimic that of a helmet, and its tiny round body is ruffled and chipped, like it's been in one too many fights. The shape of its wings came from an accidental discovery in my sketches that several overlapping and oversized feathers gave the impression of a single wing beating so rapidly that it looked like it had many wings, so I left that as a final look for the design. It also gave the impression of a feather crown that an Aztec warrior might wear in battle. I wanted this first form to look tough, determined, but in a cute way. Like, aw, it's gonna beat me up. I love Pokemon like that. Burbrawl, the hyperactive Pokemon. These tiny, energetic Pokemon are a well-known symbol of tenacity in the Maza region. They may be smaller than most bug types, and weigh less than a pound, but Burbrawl are always willing to give it their all in battle. Zipping back and forth with movements faster than the human eye can perceive, they land blow after blow with their needle-like beak until their opponent grows annoyed and gives up. Despite their indomitable will, these Pokémon can easily overexert themselves, which sometimes causes them to faint. Twitch chat helped me a lot while I was designing these Pokémon. I'll elaborate on that a bit more when I get to the final form, but the entire concept for this second stage was a suggestion from a Twitch viewer watching me stream the concept development for this line. They suggested that the second form reflect the phenomenon experienced by hummingbirds called torpor, where they expend too much energy too quickly and exhaust themselves. This would be the second step towards the rebirth theme that I wanted to explore. The first form would have too much energy for its own good, and the second form would be so exhausted that it couldn't do much of anything. To illustrate this concept, I made the whole design droopy. Every part of the Pokémon's anatomy is limp and disheveled, even its beak. Its wings, which are a focal point of its previous forms, are dragged weakly behind it and look like they're almost never used. This calls back to the design principle that we discussed in our Hisuian forms video, characterization. The personality in this Pokémon's design is one of the strongest of any I've made so far, and it's conveyed without eyes, a mouth, or even a face. Humbeat, the exhaustion Pokémon. Though they can fly, Humbeat have such diminished energy reserves that they much prefer to walk everywhere. They drag their large wings, designed to keep them airborne for hours at a time, behind them as they trundle along. This damages their delicate feathers, and the longer a humpy goes without flying, the less likely it is to ever fly again. They can be subjected to short bursts of immense energy if they consume some of their favorite food, sweet nectar. The final form, Hummy Pummel, is made possible largely thanks to the efforts of my Twitch chat. They help me decide on the design, the typing, and through a totally legitimate and democratic poll, the name. This Pokémon was, at its point of initial conception, supposed to be a pseudo-legendary. 
The concept of a reborn warrior spirit taking on the form of a hummingbird seems pretty legendary, but the nature of the visual references I use to inform this design conflict with the established conventions of pseudo-legendaries quite a bit. I tried a design that looked a bit more humanoid, but it was too jarring compared to the first two forms. I wanted it to feel light, nimble, uh, but still like a fighter. Everything that was hummingbird about it was lost when I made it standing on its hind legs. The final design played off of the shape language of the beating wings, like in the first form. Using two shapes that extended down below the wings like straps of a cloak gave the impression that the Pokemon's wings were beating so fast that it looked as though it had two pairs. I do imagine that if it was animated, its wings would beat at incomprehensible speeds, like a hummingbird, but of course, this illustration shows the wings as they would be while visible. To push the fighting typing a bit more, I incorporated an Aztec weapon called a Makuhoidal into the design of its tail feathers. Regardless of whether or not we want this mod to be a pseudo-legendary, I feel like I've accomplished my goal of it looking tough, transcended, mighty but small, and I'm very happy with this whole line. Hummy Pummel, the Swift Strike Pokemon. When Humbeat evolves, a supernatural energy surges through it. It regains the energy of Burbrawl, but with a disciplined strength that can distribute this regained vitality into focused, decisive strikes. Hummy Pummel attacks at blinding speed, using the reinforced feathers on its tail like a club, and its dagger-like beak as a spear. When not in combat, this Pokemon regenerates its energy reserves by consuming large amounts of sugary nectar. That's it for this video, guys. I hope you enjoyed it, and be sure to let me know what you think the verdict is on Hummy Pummel's pseudo-legendary status. It might be a while until our next Mazda region video, but I want to start working on some non-Pokemon designs for the region. Trainers, player characters, etc. Let me know if that's something you'd be interested in seeing. I also finally have a concept for the mascot legendaries, but I'll save that for another video. Thanks for watching, everyone. Enjoy your holidays, and I'll see you all in the next video. Thank you.